Jesus, my God, was moved and troubled when he saw his best friends grieving Lazarus. And he says, where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then in a moment, Jesus broke down and wept over death. Well, my name is Danielle Wilson, and I am one of the teaching pastors here at Fusion. And we are beginning a brand new series this week called Let It Go. And the overall theme of Let It Go is forgiveness. I just want to start off by saying that forgiveness, it is not an easy subject. In fact, it is extremely complex. Even in this series that will be multiple weeks, we will only touch on a small part of forgiveness. We believe that the Bible gives a roadmap for us to follow in a journey of forgiveness. But for me personally, the most impactful principles um, on forgiveness come from personal stories, experience, and testimonies. And so before we get started here today, I would like us all just to bow our heads and close our eyes. And let's just invite the most important person into the room, which is our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. And so, Lord, we just say, have your way. You are welcome here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to drench this place with your presence. You said that the Holy Spirit would, would be our guide it would be our counselor, and it would be our comfort. And Lord, today, we are desperate for that. And we thank you for this. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, this morning I'm going to share my story. I want to go first. Last year, I went through a very dark season in my life. In January... I found out that we had a surprise pregnancy. I was shocked, um, but I have shared publicly about a miscarriage that we went through in 2018. And we were not planning on having any more children, but I thought that this surprise might be God's redemptive plan until February when I miscarried again. That miscarriage put me in a very dark place. It was a place of disillusionment, of deep sadness, anger. I was confused, very bitter. Honestly, I was scared um, because I had never been in such a dark place before. And it didn't make any sense to me. Um, I have been through much worse in my life. And nothing had shaken me to the core like that event had. It was also extremely confusing because I was sad and sorrowful over the miscarriage. But I also knew that infertility was not a name that we carried in our home because I had four beautiful, healthy children at home that I was extremely thankful for. And so I was confused why this event put me in a dark, dark place. I was very fortunate to spend some time in Colorado with our counselor. And during this time, I had a very vivid dream. See, the Lord, he led me through a back door. And I found myself standing in what was almost my personal backyard. But... It was a cemetery with many tombstones. And the Lord began to tell me that my whole life, the way I had dealt with pain, with hurts, with betrayal, with disappointments, rejection, abandonment, was I would go into my private backyard at night. And when everyone in my world was sleeping, I would grab my shovel. 
And the Lord showed me how I would dig a hole and bury my pain. And then the next morning, well, I would carry on like everything was okay. Everything's fine. I'd actually convince myself it was. To me, this was the very definition of forgiveness. I dealt with life. I dealt with the hard things by burying it and saying, I'm good now. The past is the past. Nothing can be done about it. I don't want my past to be my anchor. Today's a new day. His mercies are new every morning. Even quoting verses like Isaiah 43. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. But what the Lord showed me was that in February of 2023, he said, Danielle, you went into your personal graveyard. You took your shovel like you always do. And you went to bury this miscarriage, but it didn't work this time. Because all the burial sites came alive. It was like being in the middle of the worst horror movie or scary Halloween scene where ghosts and demons all came out of the tombs and said, we're not dead. You buried us. For over 40 years in your life, you have buried your pain. And now, you're not leaving this graveyard. You're going to deal with us. So last year was me sitting in my graveyard and saying, I think it's time for me to stop running from this place. I'm ready to deal with my pain and to go through all of this grieving. For the very first time, I invited people into my graveyard. There was no way I could process this amount on my own. Now I can say is that this graveyard has truly become a place of healing and it's become a place of freedom. I can say my testimony today is that my God turns graves into gardens. And so today I want to share with you some lessons on what I learned and what it meant to me to let it go. How to truly deal with offense with hurt, with betrayal, with disappointment, and to walk in the freedom of forgiveness. And so number one, the most important, is that walking in forgiveness requires strength, it requires courage, and it requires bravery. It is not for the weak or the coward. Actually, I believe that it might be one of the hardest things you do in your life is to go back and to revisit the pain that you hope was buried. What I have found after sharing my story and, and my dream with a few people is that people have looked me in my eyes and said, me too. Me too. I have a graveyard. I have a lot of tombstones too, Danielle. See, because here's what it is, is that the actual moment of pain, the actual season that you experience rejection or abandonment or abuse or the hurt, that offense was so completely hurtful and so painful. And if you struggle with forgiveness, it probably happened from someone that you care a lot about and means a lot to you, or it just might be yourself. It might be something that you did that there is such a, a shame about it. And that moment was so hurtful that as humans who have had something hardwired into our systems to avoid pain at all costs, so much so that we don't ever want to think about that situation again. 
because it will mean going back and dealing with it. What I have learned is that most humans would rather bury those moments than grieve them. See, Matthew 5, 4, and the Bible says so much about grieving and mourning. One of the most important sermons that Jesus ever spoke here on earth was the Beatitudes. And he said, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not blessed is the girl who goes into her graveyard and buries her pain because she's never given it to me and therefore she's never been comforted. Or Ecclesiastes 3 says this, there is a season for everything and a time for every event and purpose under heaven. There is a time to weep and a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn and a time to dance. Can I tell you what I learned? Is that if you don't weep and if you don't mourn, you actually don't know what true laughter and what dancing is. Because you cannot weep or mourn over something that you've buried and not dealt with. And then the Lord has so many promises. Psalms 147.3 says that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. The problem is, is that if I don't bring my broken heart to him and if I don't bring my wounds to him, he cannot heal and he cannot bind up. Psalms 23, 4 says, even though you and I will walk through the darkest valleys, we can fear no evil because he is always with us. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. His rod and his staff will comfort us. We also serve a God that has emotions. We have a God who knows how to weep. We have a God who knows how to mourn. We have a God who is deeply moved. He is not hard. John eleven thirty five 35 says, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was troubled. My Jesus, my God, was moved and troubled when he saw his best friends grieving Lazarus. And he says, where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then in a moment, Jesus broke down and wept over death. And the people around him said, wow. He must have really loved him. Or Luke 19. When Jesus begins to walk into a city he was in love with. He loved Jerusalem. Loved it. That was his promised people. And it says as he approached and he saw the city, he wept for it. He's not a man that got a little teary-eyed and was trying to control his emotions. No, he let it flow. He was so deeply moved. And he said, if you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes, and this bothers me. See, what I realized is that until I brought my pain to God, he could not heal it. See, I grew up right outside of New York City, and we were known for a saying, the culture was drilled into me, that in New York, if you're going to survive here, if you're going to make it, and you're going to thrive, New York City is survivor of the fittest. What that means is you have to be tough. You can't let people hurt you. You shake it off. It's like, duck, it's like water off a duck's back, which means that nothing has no effect on you. You just keep going. 
Can I tell you, if nothing can affect you, you're not really alive. You are numb. And see, Ezekiel 36, 26 talks about this. It says that God will give us a new heart and he will give us a new spirit that he will put within us. And he says he will remove the heart of stone, meaning a hard heart, a heart that does not feel, and he will give you a heart of flesh, a heart that feels pain as well as joy and laughter and dancing. So number one, number one is walking in forgiveness. It requires strength. It requires courage. It requires bravery. And number two is this. Ungrieved loss hardens our hearts. Peter Scazzaro says that sadly the result of denying or minimizing or burying our wounds over many years is that we become less and less human. We become empty Christian shells with painted smiley faces. Gerald Sitzer, author of an incredible book, highly recommended, called A Grace Disguised. He lost his mother, he lost his wife, and his young daughter in a horrific car accident. This book talks about that he chose not to run from his loss, but to walk directly into the darkness. And he let that experience of that overwhelming tragedy transform his life. And I will quote what he says. He learned that the quickest way to reach the sun and the light of day is not to run west chasing after it, but it is to head east into the darkness until you finally reach the sunrise. Number three is this. I learned I didn't know how to grieve. A helpful tip I heard is that grief requires both anger and sadness. See, some people just get angry. And if they don't experience a balance of sadness, then you get bitter. And some people just get sad. And if they don't experience a balance of healthy anger, then they get stuck in grief. The second thing that I did to learn how to grieve is that I camped out in Psalms most of last year. David and the Psalms will teach you how to grieve and how to worship. And that is because what makes our grief different from someone that does not know Jesus is we have the power of worship. Of the 150 Psalms, two-thirds are of David lamenting and complaining to God. Yet the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. It says that David was a friend of God. But have you ever read Psalms 13 when David gets really honest with God and says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? But verse 5, David always ends his psalms like this. But, but I trust in your unfailing love, my heart rejoices in salvation. And I will sing of the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. See, when you begin to be honest with God, and yet at the same time declare that he is good all the time, there is a power that comes over you and begins to melt the grief. Psalms 22, David says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, and yet I am not sleeping. I have insomnia because I have no rest. Verse 3, 
but you are holy. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors are, have trusted in you. They trusted and God, you rescued them. They cried to you and they were set free. They trusted you and God, you were not disgraced. Meaning if you did it then God, I know you can do it now. The problem is, is that we are uncomfortable with such rare and confusing bluntness to God. We're not used to that kind of Christianity here in the United States. We don't think that God can handle that kind of rawness. And so when we do not process before God the very feelings that make you and I human, like fear or sadness or anger, we begin to leak. And I believe that our churches are filled with leaking Christians who have not treated their emotions as a discipleship issue. I believe that the church in the United States is filled with very nice people, very respectable people. Very few explode in public, I mean explode in anger, at least in public, right? The majority, like me, want to appear noble and faith-filled. And so we stuff these difficult emotions and feelings, and we trust that that's what God wants. But the result is that we leak. We don't leak through in ways that are bad. No, they're just soft, like passive-aggressive behavior. Sarcastic remarks, a nasty tone of voice, or the giving of the silent treatment. So one is walking in forgiveness, it requires strength, a lot of courage, a lot of bravery. Number two, ungrieved loss, it hardens our hearts. Number three, you might have to learn how to grieve. And the Psalms is a great teacher. Number four is this. Ungrieved pain will cost you something. Meaning that when you don't deal with it appropriately, that pain is trapped within you. You may not even know what it is, but it just feels like something is off and it feels uncomfortable. Peter Schizero says this. In our culture, Addiction has become the most common way to deal with pain. We will reach for our phones. We keep busy running from one activity to another. We will work 70 hours a week, indulge in pornography, overeat, drink, take pills, anything to help us avoid the pain. I am a part of a, um, a group, a small cohort of Christian leaders in different various ministries across the United States, and we get together once a week on a Zoom call. And this past week, a gentleman on the West Coast was sharing with our group, being very vulnerable, saying that a few years ago, he loves to run. That's how he clears his head. It's relaxing for him. He was going for a nice run, headphones in, he was completely hit by a car from behind him and went through the windshield and a very, very painful accident. Um, and he said, of course, they gave me pain meds. And they told me to take this for the pain. And he goes, I did, but I didn't know how to process internal pain. I didn't know how to process the fact that I was really angry about that accident. I was angry that my running and my hobby had been taken away. I was angry that I was newly married only in my 20s and this was the cards life dealt to me when I was trying to do what was right for God. He said, so what I found out very quickly is that opioids not only take away physical pain, but they take away internal pain. And he said, so, when I felt physical pain, I reached for the pain meds. And when I didn't even realize it, I was reaching for pain meds for internal pain. 
because I didn't know how to grieve. Until he goes, I realized I was completely addicted. Another person said, yeah, I don't really know how to grieve either. I don't know how to process pain. If I was to be quite honest, I probably drink one or two extra than what I should. For me, it was extreme people pleasing. It was busyness. It was running from one activity to the next. It was being a workaholic, completely addicted to producing and perfecting and performing, which left me borderline on the point of burnout. And last, number five. Ungrieved pain and loss creates isolation and loneliness. Some of us demand that someone or something, a marriage, a sexual partner, an ideal family, or children, an achievement, a career, or a church take our loneliness away. When what we're trying to do is cover up deep losses. Walking in forgiveness, it requires strength. Ungrieved loss, it'll harden our hearts. We have to learn to grieve. Ungrieved pain, it'll cost you something. And ungrieved pain and loss creates isolation and loneliness. And so today, and in these next few weeks that we enter into this series, I'm inviting you to come with me on a journey. Come with me on one of the hardest things I guarantee you'll ever do. But you will see Jesus. You will experience his comforts. You will experience his healing. And I promise you, you will experience freedom and dancing and laughter. I want to give you, maybe you're sitting here thinking, I don't even know where to start. I have three simple things I'm going to end with. One, just start paying attention. This week, think about your graveyard. Think about your secret place in your minds that you've stuffed so far down. What comes to your mind when you start thinking of what you're running away from, what you're trying to prove, what you're trying to achieve. Maybe start by just writing down some offenses that have happened to you. In the Fusion app, we've actually attached a worksheet if maybe you just need some questions to prompt. It will help you just answer some of those questions. Number two is this, wait in the confusing in between. This is the hardest stage. It's the process that God takes you through for healing and restoration. But only God knows how long it will take. I remember I was out to breakfast with my good friend, Kathy. She's here today. And I told Kathy one time, she asked me, how are you doing? And I said, I feel like a burn patient in a hospital. I've read that patients with third degree burns have to have bandages removed. And then the medical team, they, they clean the burned tissue, that sensitive, burned, deep tissue. And then they put on fresh bandages. And then they rip the bandage off the tissue and they do it all over again, twice a day. And this is to prevent, prevent infection and to promote healing. But I have heard that you can hear excruciating screaming at times from these patients. I have heard that you can hear them wailing out when these bandages are being removed and the scrubbing is happening. And sometimes, I told her, it doesn't feel he is kind to me. 
Sometimes I think if he was kind, he would heal me right now. But I've been sitting in a burn unit for months with the bandages being changed over and over. And I said, I know it's for my good, but it hurts so bad. For me, during this in-between time, I spent time journaling, meeting with counselors and mentors and spiritual directors, and camped out in Psalms. And I want to offer you here today, as your church family, as your church home, you have an incredible pastoral team here. And they would love to meet with you. And they would love to journey with you one-on-one. -on -one. And so if you need someone to listen to you and to maybe just help you process this journey, we are making this available all during this series that you can email talk at fusionchurch.cc or you can call the office or you can stop by the welcome desk on your way out and just let them know that you would like to schedule a pastoral care meeting. They are ready and they are prepared to take appointments, especially during the series on forgiveness. And lastly, pay attention, wait in the confusing in between, and let the old birth new. We just came out of Easter weekend and every death in Christ means resurrection. The central message of the good news of Christ is that suffering and death brings resurrection and transformation. See, Jesus himself even said in John, I tell you the truth that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. God changes seasons. He turns winter into springs, but we are not in control of when that will come. But I can guarantee you that if you do not give up, that you will reap the harvest of grieving, that he will turn your mourning into dancing. Amen? Well, I'm going to end. We're going to end with a song that I've requested. But before they do that, I want to tell you the story behind this song. And maybe you know it, and maybe you don't, but this is a gift. In the 1870s, Horatio Spafford was a successful Chicago lawyer and a close friend of evangelist Dwight L. Moody. Spafford had invested heavily in real estate, but the Chicago fire of 1871 wiped out his holdings. His son had died shortly before the disaster. Spafford and his family desperately needed a rest. So in 1873, he planned a trip to Europe with his wife, Anna, and their four daughters. Yet just before they set sail, a last minute business development forced Horatio to return to work. Not wanting to ruin the family holiday, Spafford persuaded his family to go as planned and intended to catch up with them later. With this decided, Spafford returned to Chicago and Anna and the four daughters sailed to Europe. Unfortunately, their ship collided with an English vessel and sank in only 12 minutes. The accident claimed the lives of 226 people. Anna Spafford had stood bravely on the deck with her daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie, and Tanetta, desperately clinging to her. Her last memory of the disaster is that of her baby being violently torn from her arms by the force of the waters. Just nine days later, Spafford received a telegram from his wife in Wales. It read, saved alone. When Horatio Spafford made the ocean crossing to meet his grieving wife, he sailed near the place where his four daughters had sunk to the ocean's depths. There, in the midst of his sorrow, he wrote, It is well with my soul. The words of Stafford's hymn have brought comfort to so many in grief. They say, 
when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lots, whatever my lots, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul.